Jacob Shea. And I'm David Fleming. And uh, we and Hans Zimmer composed the music for Blue Planet 2. Well, Jacob and uh, Dave, thanks so much for inviting me over to your guys' studio. So great to chat. Um, Good to have you. Yeah, thanks. So I uh, really love the score for Blue Planet. I think you guys did an amazing job. Oh, but uh, before we dive into that, I would love to kind of start with um, uh, both of you kind of talk about your backgrounds and kind of your history. How did you guys get started in music? What drove your passion? And how did you find yourself on the career path that you are today? Yeah, sure. I'll start. I mean, uh, I uh, grew up playing piano and uh, wanting to be in rock bands and listening to way too much Phantom of the Opera uh, for <laughs> a five-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. um, uh, and uh, yeah, sort of, sort of got interested in film music right away, I think. Uh, I, I, you know, it's something I became aware of really early on. And um, even now, uh, like if I watch a movie that I was watching, you know, like at that early age I can remember cues and things like that so I think for me it was you know my mother's a, a literature teacher and uh, I think I inherited my love of story from her and uh, I think for me it was like music and story hand in hand all the time um, speed it up a little bit uh, started working when with, you were six yeah no, six, <laughs> seven eight uh, uh, I uh, came out to LA and started working uh, with Otley Orbison uh, started uh, working as his assistant. Um, I met him through this thing with Mike Post, this fellowship, this BMI fellowship. And uh, I worked for him for years. He was an uh, amazing mentor for me and started writing for other guys uh, around remote control and, you know, getting my own projects. And uh, and then Blue Planet 2 came, al came around uh, most recently and uh, got to work with uh, Jacob and Hans on that one, which was pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I wound up at the same place, <laughs> but how I got here is a little different. I, I uh, started with the piano, much like Dave, and uh, somewhere around middle school, high school, I, I switched over to the guitar and wanted to be in rock bands, but from the guitar part. Uh, and uh, then I went to college study guitar performance, uh, classical guitar performance, and, and developed tendonitis and switched my major to composition. Oh, wow. Uh, almost kind of as a backup plan, um, which is, you know, insane to say that now because <laughs> it, it was kind of the best thing that could have happened, really. Yeah. Um, I don't know what I would have... I'd be playing weddings or something. <laughs> Come on. No, no, I'm not. Wedding gig. Look, gig. look, look, look. It would have been a fine life. I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm just saying I had no idea what was in store when I changed majors. Um, and then because of getting into composition, I, I thought um, that, that scoring something, it didn't have to be film, video game, television. That just seemed like an interesting job. And so. Yeah. Uh, my folks had rented a, a film called 13 Conversations about one thing. It's an indie film that Alex Werman had scored. Uh, it's an amazing score. And, and I saw it on like a college vacation. I reached out to Alex and I said, dude, I'm interested in what you do. Can I just spend a summer like watching what you do? Uh, and, and, you know, I'll get you coffee, whatever. Uh, right. and, and he got back to me and said, yeah, come on down. And, and so I spent the summer uh, and, and just fell in love with the process, the collaboration element, the like technological element of, you know, being in, in, in a room and being able to have access to all these amazing sounds and, and kind of, you know, constructing these, these pieces of music seemingly out of thin air. Uh, it, it was just really an intoxicating proposition uh to to do that as a career and so when i when i graduated i moved down here and and a few years after being in los angeles i was lucky enough to to get an inter uh an assistantship with trevor morris yeah yeah who at the time was renting a room here right uh and though it didn't work out with him i i was here long enough to kind of make an impression on hans and his technical 
uh, score engineer at the time, Pete Snell. Yeah, Pete, yeah. And, and uh, through Pete's recommendation and Hans kind of seeing me at three in the morning tinkering away on Giga Studio machines... <laughs> Uh, he, he, he hired me when Trevor kind of let me go. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've kind of been here ever since. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. We were just talking about kind of your journeys to, uh, to where you are today. Um, I, you know, and you did, you guys have spent time working as additional composers before kind of coming into your own. So talk about what you learned, I guess, from going back, whether you're sitting with Alex or just sitting in with Otley, what did you guys pick up that you now kind of implement today? I mean, it's like, there's so much. Where do you much. start? Yeah, I know, I know. Really, it, it is amazing. I mean, especially when you have that kind of, that, um, you know, every day kind of in the studio, in the thick of it, 16, 18 hours a day, you know, I think even more so those early assistant years, um, as opposed to like starting to write additional music. Right. Um, uh, for people sort of uh, uh, on project to project uh i think i mean obviously you know the things that you go in thinking that you're going to learn you learn you you know the way a cue is arranged the way you know the technical aspect of things just like being how do you even go that. about yeah syncing it up yeah just yeah. every little thing just getting your mind around a studio for the first time especially like if you're like me who in in music school and college you were like using like a laptop and with finale with nothing <laughs> yeah yeah 1994 yeah. Or, edition yeah finale yeah. and reason and like why doesn't this sound like uh you know a, a flute this i hear hans like ever uses cubase yeah like yeah it's, i have the same program it's funny <laughs> it's funny my freshman year there's some guy who was like i'm gonna give you this but you gotta promise not to tell anybody, these are the Hans Zimmer guitars, and I, I don't know, I don't know what it was, but they're like, unreleased. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I bought them off a guy that yeah. had him in a band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But, but, uh, but then the technical aspect aside, like you know, looking back uh, on things, um, you know, you're there uh, to witness how a composer is in a meeting. How right. they deal with their successes, with their failures. Um, I think um, just seeing how they approach their life as a person. Uh, I think you know, especially uh, for me with Otley, who's uh, a really generous and um, uh, sort of um, he just shared as much as he could with me. I, I think that uh, it's you know invaluable those those early experiences. It's stuff you can't learn in school. I think. No, it's, I mean, yeah. in a way, it was. It was like a sort of uh, master's degree for me, you know, yeah. at least. And, uh, um, you know, and then I think, one, you know, uh, writing for other people around the same time, you kind of pick up different things from everybody. And, oh, I, I really like that about how they do, you know, what, mixing or uh, I like how they work with automation or I really love, you know, the voicings they used in their chords. And you kind of, um, you know, gather all these these things that, your taste draws you to about peop other people's processes, right? And soak soak it up as much as as much as you can. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, that's essentially my answer. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we Ditto. don't need to belabor it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's talk about uh, before we dive into Blue Planet. Um, I think a lot of people would be also curious. Uh, you know, it says for Bleeding Fingers music and kind of what the Bleeding Fingers music model is and how did this project kind of uh, how did BBC come to Bleeding Fingers? And uh, because I know Jacob, you worked on uh, Planet Earth too. Yeah. Um. So you have experience with this, and Dave coming into this one, but kind of experience that. Uh, talk about the model of Bleeding Fingers and how sure. the project landed in your guys' lap. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it's uh, it it does feel a little bit like uh, you know, kind of uh, just like kind of a godsend like yeah. <laughs> landing in the lap like you say right uh it, it was it, it was i started working with russell a long time ago russell emmanuel the, the ceo of bleeding figures right and and uh you know it, it was it was never the intention of the company i think even russell would say that that we were going to steer it in this kind of way where we would be scoring these these amazing programs that that had 
so much import on the on like the world consciousness and stuff it's it's an amazing place to wind up but but essentially russell had had a a, a longtime friend uh in the bbc kind of uh family mm-hmm. and, and through her um it's my understanding anyway i mean i I think this is how it went down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we were we were given the opportunity to put our, you know, name in the hat for next composer for Planet Earth 2. Right. So then Joshua, who was with us at the time, and, and me and, and a host of other people around campus submitted demos. They sent us three scenes to score. Oh, wow. And... Uh, Joshua took a stab at it. I took a stab at it. There, there were other people as well, and then we um, we sent him in, and miraculously enough, with you know, uh, with within about a couple months of us biting our nails while we were waiting to hear back, they got back and said that that they wanted to go with us, and they thought that Josh and I collectively, kind of complemented each other really well and they they wanted us to do the project as a team wow and then that was kind of like a light bulb moment where it was like hey you know this is this is actually a way to give these these nature docs that that have like an insane amount of music that you need to write yeah you can give them kind of the treatment that they deserve you can really be detailed in a way that that you couldn't if you were just by yourself or even if you were by yourself and you're handing it off to to some additional writers, right? There to fill in the gaps. To, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. To, to have two people really focused for for you know a nine month period or a seven month period on on just this project is is it was uh, it really made a lot of sense once you know in hindsight after we got through it we were like oh well this this is probably how we should do that and I think the BBC likewise felt that like, you know, the, I, and it's, it's not to say anything negative about, um, about the, the original composer of the planet earth series. He oh, yeah, yeah. wrote some amazing oh, music. Yeah. I mean, George I Fenton. like that was George, George Fenton. Fenton. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. I like the music he wrote better than I like my own music. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I really, I really think that music is beautiful. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, and, uh, and, it wasn't even like a how do we how do we do something in in his shadow because it you can't out Fenton Fenton yeah he's, yeah he's Fenton. absolutely <laughs> you're an <laughs> imposter <laughs> uh, so it it was way more the case that they they just had all this new technology in the way that they captured the animals and the way that they captured their footage and the way that they wanted to tell the story and they wanted the music equivalent of that right and so it was it was about how do we use all of the tools available to us inside the studio and and you know Hans did the main title on that one so we had access to his kind of you know mindset about how how to to do this in a new and intriguing and interesting way yeah um and, and all that wound up god I totally lost my train of thought <laughs> but it wound up working out very well right. and then we were lucky enough to do it again yeah <laughs> right yeah. and dave how did you join the project for uh for blue planet yeah well mine mine was a, a a bit more specific i didn't have the history uh with the the company that jacob did i'd sort of popped in for this one uh i was working uh on a project with hans at the time and uh i think he thought i'd be a really good fit and you know me and jacob have known each other for a long time so yeah and I'm you know I was really close with uh, uh, a lot of the team Russell I'd done a lot of work with him and uh, my wife Monica <laughs> yeah <laughs> most importantly yes. uh, was uh, uh, worked uh, with Jacob and Joshua on uh, planet Earth thing. right and uh, and also worked with all of us on blue planet yeah. so uh, yeah it was just kind of like this amazing opportunity that came around at the right time and uh, 
quite at all works yeah, together. yeah. fit yeah. together yeah. and I think what you guys did I mean it's because I grew up like with old Discovery Channel when it was like and it wasn't mermaid docs it was like actual you know real documentaries and right. I grew up watching that stuff but I really think what you guys did with Blue Planet is one of the best nature documentaries ever written oh, so I mean it you. really that's kind of you to say wowed me and, and really I think what you guys were able to do with sound and image and, and music and image and and it's it's why I kind of fell in love with I wanted to be a one of the, I wanted to be those cameramen like in the water like that's what I really wanted to do before Their I went to film school. Is, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I, I it's, mean, it's I'm, harrowing. Oh my like, god! Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have so much more respect for them than any of like my <laughs> fellow music <laughs> technicians. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's like it's a, right? <laughs> they they go to like this the far reaches of the earth to capture some the most, most amazing, amazing footage. footage. It's, yeah. it's crazy. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, you forget, especially because the shots are so beautiful. It's yeah. Like everything could, could be a screensaver. Or something. Yeah. You forget that there is someone holding a camera all the time. Like when we finally saw the episodes as they aired, they came with all this behind the scenes footage. Like yeah, at the end of every at the, episode. At the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, uh, for the most part, new to us and and like seeing the sh the scenes that you scored like recontextualized with someone there in the icy cold water or like yeah. down in the dark you're just like oh my god this is <laughs> these guys really were the heroes of the project we kind of yeah. were like uh, you know, yeah we came in at the stuff. end and like yeah. put some tunes on some yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. your air conditioned studio yeah, yeah exactly yeah. from the comfort of our santa monica <laughs> i mean this <laughs> highly temperature controlled environment <laughs> I mean the story uh, you told last last time about uh, Orla. Oh right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean uh, Orla uh, Doherty, the the producer of the the deep episode. Mm. Uh, she went in the submersible under water. Uh, in it's got to be Antarctica or something. Uh, uh, it's cold. Yeah. yeah. It's it's. But essentially, I mean, she she went. To the depths of the ocean she went and full and James Cameron. Like, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, yeah. I, I yeah. she knows him pretty well. Oh wow, <laughs> yeah. there you go. And, uh, there's, it's a pretty tight knit group in the. Yeah, exactly. Like, there are yeah. maybe three people. And, and, done to the and it's James, yeah. twenty thousand leagues on the sea. Yeah. Club, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and when she was down there, like she, the submersible actually sprung a leak. Oh my god! And there was water coming in to to where she yeah. was. Oh my god! It just saw like water on the floor, right? And, and the way she told it, it was just like so scientific and methodical, and it was like you know we kind of you know we we had we we had planned for what would happen if if this happened. Yeah. And so we kind of knew that we had two hours to kind of fix it up, otherwise we'd be <laughs> dead. Screwed. Yeah. <laughs> but she wasn't stressing, and like my heart, like BPM, just went up like twenty. <laughs> just <laughs> hearing the story. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, I, think they, I think she's like, let's just stay down. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm. Just also the, you know, uh, it wasn't all adventure either. Like you hear them talking about the monotony of it. Like that, the one, oh, yeah. there was the scene, the, the boiling sea thing. I think they went out every day for a month to trying catch to capture that phenomenon. this phenomenon right. where all these, like a school of fish are basically devoured by like every species yeah. in the area. And, uh, and it makes the sea sort of uh, seem to boil. And yeah, she said that they, they went out that, every single day and they I think they did they catch it on their last day or maybe they had to plan a whole whole trip it might have been that. a pickup I can't remember I mean wow. it's uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, <laughs> second unit I went out yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's go get some bee stock <laughs> <laughs> but, but in the it's middle like, of the ocean try you know picture that frustration of like you know having to go to work and and you know not not an air conditioned Santa Monica oh studio, yeah, and no not kidding. even getting anything. So yeah. I think of the combination of like, you know, the incredible things that they were able to capture, plus just all the, you know, all the days. Yeah, you like don't see sheer nothing. tenacity. Yeah, yeah. right. Like, yeah, yeah. The keeping on it until you get yeah. something. I'm yeah. I can't remember what the total footage was that they had to edit with, but it had to. Oh, my God, I can't imagine. Yeah, exactly. The, the I mean, ratio. That, oh, my God. <laughs> that's the other thing, being a picture editor on that and an yeah. episode producer. Yeah. There's so many choices that are made before it even gets to us. It that, made our job seem really easy. Like, any time yeah. where it's like, like oh, you know, well, one of us... That's an episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can't really complain. Yeah. <laughs>
So you were talking about, okay, wait, the journey of an episode before it reaches you. So now yeah. when an episode comes in, uh, are you scoring really kind of a locked picture? Is it, is it locked or are they still making tweaks when you start working on it? It's it's pretty unlocked. So it is went, still a yeah, moving, living thing. It was, I mean, the, the, that was a, a, a challenge with this one was, was that everything was kind of in various stages of completion hmm. until... I, I mean, I, I I think I'm remembering this right. It it kind of reached a, a critical mass <laughs> at some point, and everything was kind of on the go. And but wow, but we had known that in advance. We had known that the schedule was going to be that hectic, and so Hans, Dave, and I had collectively viewed early footage and early scenes, and we were tackling problems that we knew were were going to be problems to tackle. Mm-hmm. And you know, uh, it. At yeah. some point, it, we... I think dependent on how long an episode had in post, that was kind of, you know, how finished we were able to treat each thing. Right. Because you know, there was... Towards the end, I think we had like a week, a week and a half per episode. Wow. Um, in the beginning, we had a really nice amount of time. So, uh, uh, yeah, there was definitely some... Had to be some strategy involved for, yeah. you know... Uh, okay, talking to the producers and them saying oh we we're really happy with this sequence okay that's a pretty good clue that we can get going on this one yeah. right and you kind of you know the nice thing about it was that it's so you know all the narratives per episode mostly are are pretty disparate so you can kind of treat it as its own chapter and we would right. you know yeah. the three of us would sort of talk about how we wanted to approach the episode as a whole so we kind of had a thematic idea and that was you know, usually dictated by one of the producers who would say, like, well, I think, you know, and they, they, it was actually great because, you know, for us, we're not marine biologists, so we don't yeah. understand what the open ocean might mean. And they say, well, we really think of the open ocean as as uh, as a desert, you know, and that's kind of what we want to drive home in this ocean. So we'd be like, okay, wow. how do we... How do we make the sound of that? Or, or uh, you know, talking about the coral reefs. The coral reefs are like the, you know, that's like the Manhattan of uh, of, of the sea. It's like bustling city. So, yeah. okay, so we, you know, we could get clues on how to approach an episode. But then within them, you know, within each episode, there you have these nice sort of sectioned off parts where you don't necessarily have to worry that, like, well, if real one gets changed, it's going to affect the continuity. Uh, right. You know, you yeah. Kind of it's not like they're like little set short pieces. films. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, in that way, uh, you know, we could sort of tackle it one by one. And so, what was the? I guess what was the general approach when you guys kind of first came into it? Um, I know it definitely Hans is. I think he did the main theme on this one again. So, I mean, it was definitely felt like waves. Felt like kind of very. I don't know, voluminous and just kind of had that kind of weight to it. And, and the approach, I don't know, because the way you were talking about it, it to me, it felt almost like I was li- like on its own. If you take the score out and listen to it in the album experience, almost like a narrative. It felt mm. like, I felt like motifs were coming back and the way you would pull the theme in like four episodes in, mm. um, how did you guys structure it as a whole arc from the beginning episodes to the last episode? Was, was there a, a, a grand vision there? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think the, the grand vision, <clears throat> was mainly to do a texture mm-hmm. uh, for for the whole of the series. Uh, you know, the, the bodies of water are the are ever present. Yeah, and and so and and specifically from the the producers and, and the executive producer uh, Mark Brownlow, he wanted us to have a sound for the show that was identifiable. So. Uh, we we had kind of decided early on that that we would need an orchestral kind of articulation that mimicked the undulation and and the the kind of instability of mm. the water. Yeah, and, and we also you know took a page from the visual side of the arts and and saw how you know. Monet and, and other impressionist uh, impressionistic painters use brush strokes to kind of create mm. this texture. That's amazing. And and so we took uh, sections of the orchestra, like a woodwind section, and, and had you know uh, 
a whole section, you know, flutes, clarinets, and oboes, and bassoons all kind of play the same note within their register. Yeah. Uh, and and but not play at the same time as their neighbor. Right. If if everyone was playing at the same time, they were doing it wrong. Yeah. And so we kind of got this burbling, you know, uh, what's the right word? Bobbling. Bubbling. Bubbling. Yeah. Bubbling. The like bubbling bobbling, sea. Bobbling, gurgling. Yeah, gur- gurgling. <laughs> God knows. Well, when it was the worst, it was gurgling. Bubbles yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we, we, we lost those yeah. passes. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I think gurgling would be like drowning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that made the cut. <laughs> but, uh, Just take one. Yeah. But, yeah, we we got all these, these you know, sa- long extended samples of, of notes played this way by every section of the orchestra and that was in our template that was like our ocean sound it was wow. the, called the tidal orchestra and and aside from that i think it what was amazing about working with you and hans was we kind of had three minds on well not kind of we did yeah. have three minds on the project and yeah. so that's how i think how we were able to to create such a unified vision it, which is maybe a little unintuitive at first but like you would remember a theme that I had done mm-hmm. for something because you didn't write it you remembered yeah and you'd say oh yeah Jacob use that over here wow. and, and you know Hans would be like oh it might be a good idea to use yeah. Dave's theme over yeah. here yeah. and and because we were all in a dialogue together we, we were familiar with each other's pieces yeah. we were all working on the same project it wow. kind of it was organically nice to, happened. Yeah, yeah. It was definitely nice to be fans of what <laughs> everyone else was doing. Right. You, know, you didn't feel like, oh, well, they, I, I'm not sure about Jacob on this one. It was always <laughs> like, like I'd be like, oh man, like I love that cue that he just did. And, and uh, it was, um, no, I mean, I think also, you know, to to expand on on the title orchestra thing, because that because that was really, I think, what you're feeling when you when you hear the album from front to front to back and kind right. of. You know, besides the uh, besides the you know melodic thematic material, mm-hmm. you know, it almost functions as like a, a texture theme, you know, or yes, a sonic yeah, yeah. sonic sort of theme. So it was like we we've always felt like we had this glue to go back to, um, and then I think especially like later on in the project, the fun became like, okay, now we're gonna go off the beaten path a little bit, right? Because you know, after a while, you you know they come to you and they say well we want to have uh you know a pirate sea shanty or we want to have a a bossa nova turtle spa and you're like (laughs) well okay we're just going to put on this hat for a minute or an invasion so it it it, what was great about it was it gave us the opportunity um while while it wouldn't always be appropriate to go back to the melodic or harmonic themes we always had these sounds to sort of apply to wherever crazy tangent we were having to go yeah. in whatever particular scene. Right. So, uh, you know, um, I think as far as a grand overarching plan, you know, from start to finish, uh, I hope we had one, but I think uh, <laughs> I think really what you're responding to when uh, um, I think is that sort of um, cohesiveness. Yes, that, yes. Uh, even though we had to treat all these scenes really differently, we really had the same you know um we had this thing to go back to which kind of became the the core of of the score right it was the approach yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. um so talk about the dynamic of you three working together it it seems like hans was more involved this time than with planet earth 2 is he did you were you all in a room did you guys kind of split up duties or did you come back and just check in what each one is doing i mean what was kind of the working dynamic here yeah i mean i think it was it was kind of uh, both of the last two things you said, yeah, yeah. which is which we watch the the scenes and and later the episodes, you know, with Hans and, and kind of all discussed uh, who was doing what and 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 how we were going to kind of tie these things together and yeah. just have a discussion about it. Uh, and, and then as you know, we wrote it was very convenient all being on you know, the, the same physical space. Yeah. Right. And, and, and just, and, and, you know, email brings everyone closer. So you can, you, you, even, even if one of us was on vacation or, or whatever. You're always in the tractor beam. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You can be reached no matter what. Uh, yeah. 
So we would all just get each other's input, and it was yeah, truly it was, collaborative. It was really great. Yeah, That's I awesome. mean, I think, like you said before, like the sort of three minds uh, on a project, and um, it's it's really nice when the goal seems so shared. You know, yeah, uh, every, yeah. We we all seem to kind of want. I mean, also just the film is so good too. There's not, you know, you can't. You can approach you can approach this this kind of documentary in a, in a different way. I suppose we try we chose to approach it really cinematically and, yeah. and kind of you know empathetically uh, as as possible. Um, but I think when you're all fans of uh, of what you're watching and uh, and what each other are doing, it's not hard to kind of get excited and. Uh, and uh, yeah, three three minds are definitely better than one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges, uh, just from looking at from my point of view, would probably be to score a series with such iconic narration, of course. And I mean, narration is such a part of the of the documentary um, genre. Um, but when you have uh, Sir David Attenborough's, you know, yeah. such an iconic <laughs> voice and such a commanding voice, how do you navigate that w when you're scoring? Is an is the is his narration already there, or is it like spotted for narration, or I mean, how is it kind of that process? It's absolutely like it's it, you know it, the amazing thing about his narration is when you when you uh, we weren't privy to it while we were working. Hmm. Mm -hmm. We had there there was a script, okay, and and there were definite passages that. You know when this scene is playing, you knew these words need to be uttered in okay. some sort of fashion. And they were right. sort of like guideposts. It wasn't so. Yeah, there was just like a general feel of where there would be narration. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, uh, the what I, what I was going to say is, going from that to hearing, you know, it, he doesn't take the script and just read the script. Yeah, he, yeah. He, yeah. He he, kind of. He he transforms it into a a kind of you know a, a singular narrator. All all these scripts are being written by all these different people, but he's, right. he he like he is the yeah, yeah. storyteller, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you feel it. Yes, uh, and and I'm I think you know I was very cognizant of the fact that it would be his voice, and his voice has a certain register. That it sits in, yeah, and, and so you know, in certain key uh, parts of narration that would be delivered on a scene, I would make sure to to leave some space in the frequency range for that. Right. For but his would, voice it ever, to would it ever affect like if you had a really propulsive like if there's a lot of action going on screen, you knew there was going to be they were probably going to mix the score low here. That affect the way you write, or would you just kind of write? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, a bit, but mm -hmm. I think, like Jacob was saying, it was more like, you know there's going to be, you know, no matter what the temp vocal was, you know there's going to be this, yeah. like, layer of authority yeah. over words. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, maybe this is my version of... Like, like, I, I, I you know it was going to be all good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would, so you just kind of wrote. I would, I would kind of, uh, I would do, like, an impression sometimes, like, you know. Like, uh, really? I would try to get, like, a, you know... Uh, the, that timbre, right. but it penguins uh, walking down the ice, and <laughs> <laughs> that's not yeah. bad. Yeah. <laughs> but I've watched it a lot. <laughs> but then when you hear it, though, it's. Oh. Uh, I mean, that was I think one of the best things about oh seeing God. seeing the final thing because we yeah when we, we watched probably it. experienced the final narration about the same time as everyone else, and uh, it's just um, yeah, that's that authority. It's that yeah. like you know. Uh, the words are based in some really deep knowledge and caring. Yes, and, yes. Um, I think you know when we saw it, we, there was a, like a press thing with with him there, and when he he, he's, he skyped in, and uh -huh. when he talks, just everyone shuts up because <laughs> he, you know he's. I, I don't know. It's like um, it's like the president talking. I mean, not our current one, but uh, no, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah like uh, a commanding thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, someone you respect yes. and, yeah. and maybe look up to. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's the exact a, opposite of our president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but still, yes, yeah. the idea of a president. Exactly. <laughs> the president of nature. Yeah. <laughs> the ideal, uh, you know, a Morgan Freeman president. Right. Know, the <laughs> ultimate uh, authority. Absolutely. <laughs> How many times has Morgan Freeman 
played the president. I think he, they had to retire him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, yeah. He's done that several times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Deep impact. <laughs> yeah, right. He played God. I mean, he, you know. He's done it <laughs> all, man. That. <laughs> that. Him and David Attenborough used the same cough drops or something. Got yeah. that. Keep it rest, the rest of Yeah, they, yeah. they probably sound like us before they take the cough drops. <laughs> very high pitched and then yeah. just gonna, yeah. um for for a, sh- a series like this are temp scores used are, you, are they presenting temp scores to you to kind of feel things out or is it just kind of yeah yeah there was i didn't there was. remember that yeah i mean it, yeah it's and because i feel like for an editor to edit this thing together you have to have some sort of shape to help you i, I feel like temp scores are necessary for the editors yeah so i think it, in terms yeah. of rhythm and, and certainly with yeah. with with something that's Maybe unscripted, it might be more useful to have temp than, right. than or not unscripted, but but something where where you're taking footage that you've collected and yes. are now creating a narrative based Absolutely. around that footage. Uh, I was gonna say, I think probably for you at least, the 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 biggest challenge was that Planet Earth, you know, Planet Earth Two yeah, that oh, these guys did was was somewhat their part of yeah, it. Uh, yeah, I'd say. You know, it was it wasn't the majority certainly, yeah. but there but there were moments in, in in each episode I think where it poked its head up and and if I had written the thing previously, it was actually the worst. I had that yeah, the worst thing it could be. And, and as many times as I could, I'd have you do it. I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We'd be like, you know what? This, this was a Planet Earth thing. Let's let the new kid. Uh, well, no, Earth not thing. not yeah. that. Just literally, yeah. like, what am I supposed to do that doesn't <laughs> yeah. sound like me and accomplishes the same thing? Right, without right. copying yourself, uh, without cutting and pasting. Right? Uh, and that's uh, and. It also, you know, puts you in a creative box. It's it, it's just like, well, how do I approach this and ignore the thing that I did? Right. That that seems to work, you know. Like, yeah. Well, but no, I th- but I think in in a way it was good because we could build on the vocabulary that these right. guys set out, and they did such a great job. You know, um, Jacob, Josh, and Hans. You know, uh, I think it was definitely a compliment and a little bit of a. a uh, you know, a guidepost again to say like, build on this vocabulary. This is the the same world. This is Planet Earth. You know, Blue Planet Two. This is the same universe as right. Planet Earth. And and actually, I think having that allowed us to go in a different direction because yeah. I think at the end it it came out quite a bit differently. While it still sort of was the vocabulary, we were able to, you know, um, kind of build a, a side road out of that yeah it definitely feels part of the same universe but it's almost like a, almost, I guess like a sequel but it, it feels like it's own thing it definitely yeah. feels different than planet earth but there, there's a different shape and feel to mm. that to the to this documentary versus the other one right. so right. so yeah let's talk about the lasting impact that this music has and um so you, i mean you just did an amazing concert for planet earth 2 we conducted yeah. and uh blue planet uh 2 live in concert has been announced so talk about that knowing you have that feeling where i mean you're working you're toiling away in your dark studios by yourself but then you get to see other people come and you know the impact that it has like talk about that feeling yeah i mean uh that is absolutely like uh gratifying is like not not a a three-dimensional enough term to describe the feeling i think uh you know, first of all, conducting at the Royal Albert Hall uh, is is something that that would have never been on a bucket list that I would have made for myself because I wouldn't have seen it as a possibility. And, right. And wow. so to to have that happen was was a tremendous honor and and you know a, a surreal and, and wonderful thing that that I can kind of keep with me for my years going forward. Uh, but the being able to to kind of see jo- more broadly, you know, Josh's music and, and my music and and Hans's music being performed at, at a venue like the Royal Albert Hall and and touring Europe uh, is just it, it's crazy to think that you put in so much time like you said, in this room, toiling yeah. away, obsessing over, like, is this frequency, you know, EQ right on this one dumb thing? Right. Is this sonority appropriate, or, or is it too complex, or is it not complex enough? 
is anyone even going to care? Uh, you put in such long hours and, and you get so kind of in your own head about things that, that to see to see it in something that, that you care very deeply about being in service of something that actually is, is affecting people on, on an emotional level and, and making them interested in seeing a performance of your music uh, in connection with, with a project that you've, you know, when you work in this business, you're, you're seldom working on a project that has uh, an, an impact on, on a positive, just universally positive impact on the world. It's educational. It's, it, it's it, you know, speaking about conservation, it, it's got all, all these things to kind of... You're just it actually, trying to keep, yeah, it actually matters. I mean, that's saying that yeah, everything else does matter, but yeah, it, it I is don't such mean to be flippant yeah. in that the other stuff doesn't. But it's an important message. But it, it's it's a unique position to to be in, and it's not, I think, lost on either me or Dave or Hans or Joshua or yeah. Planet Earth that we were given the opportunity to be a part of something that that is like that. It, yeah, it, it's a it's a tremendous honor, and it's a. a tremendous high to kind of see uh, people respond to the music, respond to the program, and actually want to experience it in a different setting, a live mm. setting. Yeah. Yeah, and I can't uh, speak to the concert setting yet. Although but I you think, will. I think you will February, see. I think, is... It's uh, going to start kicking off your blue planet. Kicking off, yeah. 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 Um, no, I think, uh, you know, especially in the UK where it's like... It, you know, Blue Planet played like the Super Bowl. It was yeah. it was enormous. That's um, amazing. <laughs> and it even affected, you know, government regulation. That's yeah. It, like it, it, plastic it, straws are banned now there because wow uh, of people's response. Yeah. To seeing the episode, the Open Ocean episode. Yeah, yeah. No, I wow. mean there's like obviously like a lot of the the. Uh, and series. that's not to our credit. I'm, 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 I'm just saying. <laughs> right. But you're involved a, yeah. in something that, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. You, you did. I, I would say, it, no, you are, because you put an emotional backing to something that people reacted to. Well, I think the, the you know, the thing that we talked about a lot was uh, how do we, how do we walk the line of, like, having people empathize. Yes. Without trying to, you know, you, you, we're playing cinematic music. We're playing dramatic music. We're trying to, you know, add to the drama that the editors were able to right. carve out of these stories. So, you know, you want people to to care. You want people to get involved. You know, when there's these scenes about <clears throat> animals dying uh, from you know being trapped in a plastic bag or or swallowing too much plastic or the coral reefs dying out. Oh yeah. Um, you, you know, that, I think that's an that's a, a good time to do what we do, which is to try to make an audience empathize um, with our neighbors in the ocean. Yeah, you know? tell and a story so that we can... Yeah, yeah. So I think whether whether they're aware that, um, you know, the music is is helping them mm. come to that realization, I think uh, it's really, uh, as Jacob said, gratifying to be involved in a project that seems to have made people, you know, care about something. In the same way, maybe they would care watching you know, a, a dramatic movie, but these are things that are, uh, you know, pertinent to not only these other species' survivals, but our survivals as well. So yeah. and generations going forward, yeah. and like it can, it can be almost a call to action. Where it is in a in a fictional story that you scored? I mean, it's 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 a tremendous ride, and it might make you think differently about the world from like a philosophical point of view, or, or maybe open your eyes to to maybe not having such a myopic view of your world or whatever but right. but but this is like actionable you can you can act, you can come away with this with with being on this journey and and go to rallies or go to the beach and pick stuff up you can you can actually make a, a difference yeah. and, and that's an unbelievably uh it, it, it's just a humbling thing to be to be a part of. I yeah, think. yeah. I mean, already I've started 
carrying around my everyone's always like what, what is that cup you're carrying around well, I'm tr you know I, I I'm trying to do my small part I'm, I'm carrying this this stupid cup from <laughs> from coffee place to coffee place I won't right. accept the plastic straw from any <laughs> like restaurant I mean, yeah yes. you know th that's the just the the easiest stuff so I, I think you know but but all of those things help so I think you know all, the all three of us were really uh, affected and um, and hopefully, you know, more people will be as they watch the show, too. Especially here in the U.S. with our current administration, which is very, I mean, anti-climate acceptance yeah. of all that. So I think yeah. it's an important anti -science. time. Anti-science. <laughs> anti-science against yeah. logic and reasoning yeah. and facts. And I think uh, in, at least you're making a, the U.K. has embraced it and actually changed, whereas here I think it's more necessary to really... Yeah. really show people i mean it's an important time to have documentaries like this really kind of be blockbusters and kind of people like yeah. events and you know where it's not just something on tv at two o'clock in the afternoon but yeah. really something that you want to get on 4k blu-ray and really yeah and yeah. just really kind of get behind so um i want to thank you guys for your time thank you, this man. evening thank and to talk yeah. and to kind of dive into your world no pun intended but like <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah thanks guys uh, thanks thank lot, you man. appreciate it